Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And we're back. We're live. We are young talents making way only here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Andrea Gabrielli. I'm your host. And every Tuesday, we keep an eye on the future with our most brilliant school students as we talk about their science projects. And joining me today is Ryan Wynn from Kaiser High School, who carried out a science project about dementia and the Alzheimer's disease. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's very nice to have you here here today, as I understand you are a VIP, really. You are first place overall best in category for biomedical and health sciences. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Is that correct? Yeah. And then I understand you also received several awards from the American, the American Chemical Society, that's right. uh, the Queen's Health System, and the US Army. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank and you. Again, thank you for being here. And before we, we begin, I would like to take uh, just a short amount of time uh, to thank B.B. Uh, Davis, who is here with Dr. B.B. Davis, who is here with us today from uh, the Department of, Ed of Education as well as the University of Hawaii, and who's going to join us here uh, in the show. She is one of your mentors, Ryan. Yes. Uh, and, and also, I would like to thank um, all of our audience, because this is going to be our last show before a small uh, summer break. Uh, but this, uh, this, is, as, this has been an incredible season, really. Uh, we've been um, here with Young Talents Making Wave. We've been uh, featured on OC16 every, every consecutive episode as uh, we made it to the top five list on FinTech shows for the most viewed, one of the most viewed with shows here on FinTech. So thank you very much, everyone, for watching us and for supporting us. Um, now, uh, Ryan, I'm curious about your project, uh, uh, you know, this uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Why did you pick this topic for the science fair? So, well, um, there are a few different inspirations. One of them, especially about the dementia part of it, yeah. was my great-grandmother, who actually um, has dementia. And especially when I was younger, it was really hard for me to come to terms with the fact that she would not recognize me. Wow. She would not understand, um, she would not remember the things that she cared about. And that really did stick with me for a long time, and of course that was part of the inspiration. Yeah. But another part was, well, I'm um, currently a full-time college student as well as being in high school. Right. And uh, I took Terrific. psychology <laughs> <laughs> and philosophy classes. And um, in these philosophy classes, I learned about philosopher John Locke who um, investigated how consciousness, I believe, was the key to personal identity. Right. Um, and, <laughs> today we have uh, this uh, particular background for our show today. This is a painting by uh, Picasso. It's the, the, um, the girl with the mirror. And, and I was reading that uh, art, and particularly the way consciousness develop in the brain, the way we think and everything, can strongly affect uh, uh, dementia patients as well. Some people uh, at the MoMA, the New York, the Museum of Modern Art, just by looking at this very painting here, they developed an interest in art, they wanted how to learn, and they slowly improved. So that's really something amazing, and it's great that you are really, uh, you know, learning and studying uh, for this. So maybe, uh, Ryan, why don't we have your first slide up so you can, we can tell us, you can tell us more about uh, this dementia science project that you carried out. Sure. Yeah. So um, here, this is just an image of the brain. You can see a cross section. And okay. um, you can actually see the hippocampus and the amygdala, two of the um, main regions that I looked at in this project. What are they? Well, the hippocampus, it has large effects on memory. Um, OK, so it's a memory, it's a memory um, storage, can we say, for the, for the brain? Uh, it creates new memories oh, and okay. transfers um, short-term memories into long-term memories. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. OK. So it's very important. It's also affected early on in Alzheimer's disease. And there's also the amygdala, which is another one of the places I looked at. Which is which the purple one we're looking at in this uh, image yeah. that with the, the, the arrow. Yeah. That's right, right next to the hippocampus. Right next to the hippocampus. And this area has effects on emotion, including emotional connections. Okay, so that's why you focus particularly on this. Definitely, yeah. yeah. So what's your science project about? Well, in this project, I used um, data sets from two different databases and using a certain program called FreeSurfer. I turned these um, data sets, which came from an MRI machine, into processed MRI images that were 3D based and uh, they were 3D vo and voxel based. And I used these to create these volumetric images that I could perform volumetric analysis on. 
and look at how Alzheimer's disease would affect the brains of these different patients. So you were trying to see uh, a connection between the size of these amygdala and hippocampus uh, uh, with normal patients and uh, pe people affected with dementia, is that yes, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. And I also looked at two different areas of the brain um, besides the hippocampus and amygdala, which were the insula, which um, has multiple different effects, and the entorhinal cortex, which has similar effects to the um, hippocampus which is memory, but it's also the, supposedly, the first area in the brain affected by Alzheimer's disease. Right. Uh, and so let's maybe see uh, another picture that you brought us, uh, another image of the brain. Uh, so what are we looking at here? Well, yeah. this uh, here, it's a carved out area of the brain, and you can see that little pink thing in yeah. the center is actually the insula, or the insular cortex. Okay. And I just wanted to point out how um, deeply hidden inside the brain this insula is. It really is. It it's in has. the middle of the, oh, of the yeah. whole structure. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So what's the role of this particular? Uh, well, the insula itself has many effects, and these include consciousness. As I was thinking about um, with John Locke, how he thought about consciousness. Right. Uh, it's it the has, connection between. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. It has effects um, on interpersonal connection and even the gut feeling that we get, say, when we're scared or, say, you walk down a dark alley alleyway. Yeah. Where did you find the, the images, the data that you used as part of this project? So the, um, the data that I actually got was two raw MRI image sets. Yeah. And these came from two different databases. The first was So the, databases. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Two different databases. And so the, you, how did you calculate, the, how did you estimate the volumes of the amygdala and the hippocampus? So with these raw images, they came as, well, just images, grayscale, Just um, gray not much pictures, data. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But with using FreeSurfer, I was able to turn these into images that um, were voxel-based, where each different voxel or cube was one millimeter cubed. And with this, I could also use FreeSurfer to approximate the area of these different regions and the volume of these. And the volumes That's as well. I believe the next slide is about, uh, is an image scan that you acquired, that, that you got and you processed, yeah? yeah. Can you tell us something about uh, so this particular image? So here is um, an image that has already been processed by FreeSurfer, yeah. that, well, that I processed. And you can see the different areas that are labeled. It's a cross-section? Yes, that's okay. right. It's a cross-section. Uh, I believe coronal cross-section. Yeah. But here I was trying to point out the entorhinal cortex, which is one of the regions I looked at, and that should be right at the edge. And I also want to point out how much information that this image would give over a normal grayscale MRI image. Right. So basically, you got a sort of a, a, a bunch of data images, and then with this software, you can slice. You can sort of slice the brain and have a look at all the different parts of it. That's yeah? right. Yeah. And so, as part of this, as you got basically the images, but you had to do the processing as well. Uh, I believe we have an image that you brought us here for your code, the code that you developed to process all these images. How did you develop this? How did you develop this? Uh? Well, this code, the code that I used, was generally based off of the original FreeSurfer stuff and this, um, not stuff, but the code that FreeSurfer uh, uses to process these images. Right. But there were a few steps in the beginning that were specifically needed since I used a kind of, um, I used a certain way to, instead of using directly using Linux, which is what um, people would normally do, I used Bye. Windows. <laughs> oh, so okay. I had a few different steps that added to the code that I needed to use um, for proper processing. And this was mostly just trial and error and using um, materials that were already open to me. So how many um, mentors did you have? We mentioned Dr. B.B. Davis, uh, but then you also had uh, some others, yeah? Yeah. As part of this. So you really got involved with the uh, science, the medical science community, I guess, to really try and, and bring uh, and carry out the science project. How was this experience, really? A lot of it was you know, having all these mentors. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and, there were a lot of people, and a lot of it was really knocking on doors. And I'm sure other people will relate to this too. But it, just looking for mentors, looking for people who can help, and. Um, it's great that there are so many people like these, these mentors that are willing to give back to the younger people, that are willing to give back to the community. It's absolutely terrific, as you said, and the, the, the state of Hawaii Science and Engineering Fair is truly a wonderful opportunity, you know, for students like you, talented students, young talents like you, to really engage with this. Uh, and 
science community, but also how was uh, um, uh, you know sharing this information? Because there are a variety of people around the world who are affected by dementia. There are huge numbers here in Hawaii, the world as well. And also for um, the ohana of these people, the families of these people, is very, very challenging, as we remember your great-grandmother. Right. Yeah. How, how was, it, how was it sharing this information with the community as part of the science fair experience? Well, um, definitely part of what I tried to do with uh, the science fair was share my ideas of how FreeSurfer, which is generally used for research, yeah. might be used in a clinical setting where um, oh. that's why I compared with CDR, or clinical dementia rating, a rating of um, various clinical factors put together to see how bad dementia is. Right. And I, while comparing this with the volume, using FreeSurfer and my own methods, I was able to look at how possibly um, FreeSurfer would be used in a clinical, um, in a clinical field, possibly since it gives so much more information than the raw MRI scan that doctors may be getting. That's wonderful. It's a wonderful project, Thank wonderful. You. And you know, we, we need to learn more about this. So let's have our next slide up so we can see. This, I believe, is going to be a difference between uh, demented versus normal image. Is that right? So maybe if we can have uh, the, the slide up so we can see. OK, so uh, how do they differ in terms of, uh, you mentioned the size amygdala and the hippocampus. How do do they differ? That's right. Well, um, here it might be a little hard to see due to the size, but um, I pointed out the amygdala in light blue and the hippocampus in olive green. So these are two pictures. Above we oh, have yeah. the normal brain, I guess, yeah? Yeah. And below is the demented one. Yes. Yeah, okay. And you can see the thinness of the different volumes of the brain and the decrease in volume in general of these two areas that I looked at. Okay. You can even see in the, um, the gray matter, which is the gray colored material. I mean, I'm sorry, the gray matter, which is the pink colored material, and the white matter, which is the gray colored material, there is a difference in volume. Right, okay. Uh, let's see some uh, result slides that you brought us here, so we can compare. Okay, so this is uh, uh, total volume of the amygdala I see on the y-axis. Uh, yes. And then on the x-axis, what is uh, a CDR? So yeah. CDR is the thing I mentioned before, the clinical yeah. dementia rating, which is made up of different clinical variables. Okay. Um, where zero is a normal patient and three is a severely demented patient. And you can see as CDR gets worse, noting that um, clinical dementia, I'm sorry, <laughs> as CDR gets worse, noting that the Alzheimer's disease and dementia gets worse, you can generally see that these volumes will decrease. Okay. This is really a terrific science project that you carried out with a lot of implications for people of the communities who are affected with these problems. And so I'm very curious to learn more from you as we learn about your science project, but also from Dr. Bibi Davis, who is going to join us here after our break. We'll be back soon. Hey, aloha. Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation Every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. And we're back. We're live. We're young talents making way here on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we have Ryan Wynn, who is talking about dementia, about his science project. But also, oh, we have a new guest here. 
Dr. B.B. Davis is uh, joining us. Thank you for being here, B.B. Thank you for being here with us. So B.B. is uh, from the Department of Education, a STEM teacher of teachers, so I understand, and also the University of Hawaii uh, scholar, but also a mentor for Ryan, and also a judge at the science fair. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Thank you. And so, um, how does it take for for you, for a professional scientist, a teacher, to actually mentor a brilliant student such as Ryan uh, as, as, at the science fair? For, for um, initially, you get to know the students a little and their interests, and then you explore with them where they want to go with it, and then you try to find partnership with the University of Hawaii and even with members of the DOE or greater population out there, and um, to help mentor these kids um, in terms of the science also providing lab facilities for them to... The lab uh, facilities, which right. we talked about in a variety of right. other shows yeah. before. Yeah. And these lab facilities are high-end research lab, you know, like um, UH. Uh, and these are the labs where professional research is carried out. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, it provides an opportunity for these students to go in there and, you know, they have curiosity and they want to innovate. You know, they, they have imaginations and with the new things that's happening today. So, like, for example, so what Ryan did was he went out there and took what programming, which is an area that's helping us understand a lot of um, scientific areas better. And he's trying to use that to enhance MRI scans to kind of have a, a better clinical evaluation from it. Right, and that, that's really something that can help the right. people, you know, to face this, this, uh, these issues as well, these this diseases, yeah. yeah. And some of the other things we uh, we have to do um, to help the students or mentor them is also not just the science behind. So for one, you kind of assist them in thinking what is the science behind their project. And Because if a, a six-year-old can't understand their project either, then they're not explaining it the, the way Some of the scientists can't right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, so for one, I always tell them, you know, a six-year-old must understand what you're saying, but also a professional scientist must understand what you're saying. And um, also, that journey of evaluation, looking at the data, interpreting what they have. You have to interpret this right. data, yeah. But also, um, I understand that a presentation, the presentation of the data is also something very important that needs to be taken into account, is that yes, right? very important. Yeah. And then um, some of the, uh, the presentation, how you present, so we even work in that, because sometimes if the student is not connecting with the audience or the judge or whoever they're presenting to, then we need to rethink how we do that. So we always right. Talk about the voice and how they present themselves, even from the way they dress as they go out there and <laughs> represent, the, you know, themselves and um, the, our state. And so, the other uh, in the scientific part of it, also after the interpreted data, we also talk a lot about what is the limitation of your conclusion, your result. Right, because yeah. you have to put it in context, yeah, right. to, to to try and see. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Ryan, how was your you know experience uh, working with BB and you know these uh, mentors that you had? How was this? I understand that you spent long nights, you know, with <laughs> doing science and everything. There were a lot of late nights, like a few times um, we stayed up like up to two or three just talking about my speech, wow. but I would say how I would present. And this is really important. Um, sometimes the judges will really care at these science fairs it's about BB. how you present. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And well, it's been a really positive experience, and uh, I've learned a lot. I've done a lot of new things, figured a lot of things out, and hopefully, I can continue with this kind of thing. And that's why I love the science fair so much. It opens up so many possibilities. <laughs> it's amazing, really. And so that leads to my next question: What's next? What do you see next with Bibi? You know, as part of this research that you're carrying out. Let's see. Well, there are, <laughs> there are a lot of different possibilities. Because you are, you are in high school, but you are at the same time taking um, college classes, yeah? That's right, yeah. So that's, yeah. So what do you see, you know, ahead? Well, so more short term, I've been thinking about um, with expanding this project, hopefully maybe looking at how to reduce the limitations of Free Surfer, where there's a lot of um, learning and a lot of tools that you have to learn. Uh, to um, effectively use it, especially with the manual editing as well. Right. Or possibly um, getting more patients, looking at more data sets, since every patient matters, of course. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And well, um, further long term, I've been hopefully looking into getting into research. 
mm. as a <laughs> occupation or possibly becoming, yeah, pretty much a researcher. That's where yeah. BB comes in handy. <laughs> <laughs> And, and a lot of other, so it, it's not just a one person with Brian, uh, Ryan or any of the other students we mentor, but sometimes three, four mentor. Like in um, Ryan's case, we had my husband, Dr. Harry Davis, we had Kalpana from the University of Hawaii, we had Dr. Nick James from UH, so a group of people. It's really a team. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a yeah. teamwork That's of people. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so let me ask you, um, from the judging perspective, uh, how is, uh, you know, you judge a lot of projects, uh, I also judge some projects <laughs> occasionally, but how is this experience, uh, you know, for you being a, a researcher, mentoring, mentor of students, how is the judging process? Yeah. The judging process is really to, um, for one, help the student help evaluate what they're doing, and for us to also, as we talk to them, to help them kind of enhance their curiosity about things, like what if, have you thought about this, you know, what if you've done it? with another, instead of free surfer, what if you'd done it with another program? Do you think you would have gotten the same result or better? Um, why are you really doing this? And so for a judge, you know, we learn also from the students. As Absolutely. You, yeah, yeah, because like even for Ryan, like uh, while I was mentoring, you know, we talked, uh, I, the questions I would have like, well, how is this free, this free surfer, how are you going to code more into the coding are you use it? Yeah, are you gonna, yeah. to um, to help give you a better output image and so you learn from the students or even have you know as a judge, you come up with questions. Well, what if it's there? About well, you know, what if you do this? And to see how the students will interpret it too. But you grow with the students also yourself because I think every year I judge, every year I learn something new. And the energy in the room when you judge, you know, like I always you know say, it's like the mecca of great minds that come together, it's young scientific mind helping to solve problems that haven't been solved yet. It's really a terrific experience, yeah. Okay. Uh, so Ryan, what did you learn more from the judges this year for your particular project that we're talking about today? So this What's is the, the first time, time yeah. I was able to get past the, um, the state science fair and go to the international science fair. And oh, okay. I, yeah, yeah. well, part of it was um, I've always been writing speeches and stuff to help me practice. But when I practiced um, for the first time at this international science fair, I did terrible. Really, I did oh. really bad. So I, um, on the day of the judging, which I had been, well, I had been using the speech up to the night before, I decided I would ditch it. Oh. So I lost Last my minute. speech. <laughs> yeah. Actually, in the middle of one of my judging periods, I got rid of this speech. And I just talked about what I knew, and it ended up working a lot better. Yeah. Wow, wow, that's terrific. So uh, what's the difference, I guess, so the, the main winners of the, our Hawaii State Science Fair goes, uh, get to go to the International Science Fair, but how is uh, the International Science Fair different with respect to the, the state one? Do you get to know uh, a lot of more students, I guess, coming from all over the place, yet with projects and everything? How was this experience? Uh, it was it was great. We got to meet so many new people. There were people from um, all over the world. We got to meet people from Vietnam, uh, I believe Thailand, a lot oh, of different wow. places. Wow! And uh, it was it was definitely a learning experience. And looking at the projects that were there at ISF, it was kind of scary. But I also <laughs> noticed that there was um, a lot of focus on practicality. Right. And real uses, not just say um, developing things that maybe a few people could use. No, absolutely. But trying to find yeah. things for um, the population that could really help everyone. For everybody. Did you go along? I did not go this year, but I've judged at the International Science Fair previously. I've done the Phoenix, I've done LA, and it is about about yeah, let's 17, give some numbers, yeah. yeah. 17, 1800 students from about 80, 90 countries you have there. And it's amazing, people from all over the world come there, they're, they're speaking in different languages, but some of them have inter interpreters. Oh, and really? So, personally, I've judged students from Russia, and they have interpreters, and we try wow. to make sense of the project. The interesting thing is they do not, if you have an interpreter or not, they do, they do not give you extra time. You still have that 10 to 15 minutes a lot of time. To present. So to it's really yeah. challenging for them Very as well. Very challenging. Wow. And a lot of projects, those projects, you know, you see companies will buy them or, you know, one year was there, the student had a patent going on on his project. And so these 
you know, these kids and become not just scientists, but ambassadors to the world trying to solve problems and go out there and find other kids and I like them. that. Ambassadors, so, yeah. or, you know, for, for an issue, a particular issue to the world. Yep. That, that's a wonderful experience. That's yep. a wonderful experience. Um, let me ask you, uh, so you mentioned the, uh, the numbers of this international science fair. Do you see it growing every year? There are more bright minds coming up? Yes. Um, wow. it, it's been growing by numbers every year. Uh, I mean, the number of countries that's getting that's involved terrific. and all that. That's terrific. Yeah. So uh, a small, you know, we have about one minute left for our conversation today. Time flies. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Bibi, just a small wrap up about the importance of the, the, the science fair, our state international science fair. Yeah. The importance of the state science fair is that you know every kid is curious. Every kid wants to learn and know something. And they're always there's so many problems they can solve today. And you know with new technology and innovation and creativity, you know kids want to invent. And so this provides a platform for the kids to come and try. And so with enough support and the right support the and yeah. the community and a lot of partnership, uh, we help move that kid and make it happen. So we make dreams possible and for yeah, one, dream possible. Yes, yeah. and help the world to be a better place. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bibi. You're Thank welcome. You. And, and Ryan, uh, as an ambassador to the world <laughs> for this big problem, which is dementia, uh, what do you tell our audience as a final conclusion, final wrap up? Well, I really, I would like for everybody to just, I mean, um, these kinds of science fairs and things are open to a lot of different people. And I would really like more people to go for the opportunities that they have. Um, that has got a lot of people where they are now, and these science fairs really do help a lot. Um, it might be like they take up too much time, things like that. People don't have time to do it, and that's a big thing at the school where I go to. My brother and I were the only people who actually um, really went anywhere in the science fair since we have more time than the other students. And I really, I hope that these opportunities continue to be given and continue to be take, continue to be taken as well. Thank you very much. You're thank you. Thank you, thank you Bibi, for being here. Yep. Thank you, Ryan, for being here. And uh, so you've been watching uh, Young Talents Making Way here on Think Tech Hawaii. This is the last show for this season, but next season we will be back for more. And actually, Brendan, uh, your uh, Ryan's brother, will be back for the opening show of the season. So stay tuned.